Please bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the commitment that we have witnessed of these five individuals being baptized today and pray that your spirit will remain with them and with all of us. And as we open your word now, Lord, give us a message of hope and encouragement. Give us uh, an uplifting message. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. When Michael stands up, Daniel 12, verse 1, I believe is one of the most important and tightly packed verses in all the Bible. And taken a few verses prior to it and a few verses afterward, uh, it covers uh, the majority of what the Bible describes as taking place at the end of time. And uh, we just want to dig into it. Uh, just a, a little review of what we talked about last time. We talked about the fact that the verse opens with the phrase at that time and, and in the text it's referring to a special time. Not just any general time, no, a specific uh, identifiable time. At that time, Michael will stand up. Michael in the Bible is a code term referring to Jesus Christ. And we looked at some of the texts that, that uh, bear that out. But that time, Michael will stand up. Well, when we read the phrase, at that time, it leads us to consider what led up to that. And so we went back a few verses, and uh, we are looking at verse 43 of Daniel 11 to kind of build up the uh, background to this passage. Remember in the Bible, there originally were no chapter divisions, no verses. It was just one narrative that flowed. So uh, we go back to verse 43. Daniel 11 is uh, what we call a blended prophecy, a layered prophecy. It starts out by talking about the king of the north, which in the original uh, primary sense was the king of Syria. This was after the kingdom of Greece broke up and part of it went towards Syria. Part of the kingdom was uh, Egypt, the Ptolemies, and they were at war with one another and Israel was caught in the crossfires. And so there was a lot going on in the period of time uh, before Christ's first coming uh, that was uh, traumatic and disturbing uh, for the Israelites as the Syrians and the Egyptians battled it out. Now, as the chapter progresses, we, we discern we understand that when it talks about the king of the north, it's no longer talking about the literal king of the north. There are some things that are described in uh, verses 31 to 36 of that chapter that lead us to believe that as we get down to the end of the chapter, the king of the north is no longer uh, the Seleucids of Syria, but it's talking about another entity, an entity which has been at war against God's kingdom. And that entity uh, is identified no fewer than seven times in the Bible. So it must be important. Three times in the book of Daniel and four times in, in the New Testament. Uh, the, the entity that the king of the north represents, and I want to say this very delicately, uh, represents the historical papacy. Now when I say that, I want to make it very clear that the Bible is not talking about individual members of, of the Roman Catholic Church. It's talking about the hierarchy, the leadership, the theology, the system of the papacy, which through the ages, Satan has used to change the teachings of this book. This book is what God has given us to know the way of salvation, right? The Holy Bible describes to us who God is and how we can relate to Him. Satan has been at war against this book. And so uh, he has infiltrated the church, as he did in previous times, and he has uh, corrupted and changed and altered the teachings of the Bible, and even gone so far as to uh, attempt to change the holy law of God written in stone by God's own finger, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. And so the king of the north at the time of the end represents the historical papacy, the system of the papacy, not individual members. There are wonderful Catholics. Don't misunderstand. But uh, the system of the papacy is the king of the north at the time of the end. And in verse 43, we saw that at the time of the end, it says, many will follow at his heels. Many will follow at his heels. This is describing what we are now seeing in the religious world a coming together. 500 years ago, there was something called the Protestant Reformation, which brought about a division, as there were those who sought to go back to the Bible and find their source of doctrines, their teachings from the Scriptures. And so there was a, a, a division 
And, and uh, there was much bloodshed and sacrifice that brought that about. That was 500 years ago, Martin Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, and others. But we find now that there's a strong push toward bringing all Christianity back together. And we're told it doesn't matter what you believe. Uh, just come together and God will sort those other details out later. Don't worry about it. Well, it's a dangerous thing to abandon the teachings of Scripture. I know that for some people the word doctrine is a bad word. But the word doctrine just means teachings. And that's what this book is filled with. So to abandon the teachings of the Bible uh, is a very dangerous thing. There is a push toward bringing uh, the Christian church uh, together today and to abandon the, the teachings of Scripture. And that's what it's talking about when it says there will be many that will follow at his heels. What I find interesting in, the, uh, in the, this, this prophetic description is that there are other verses in the Bible that go along with it, that, that sustain, substantiate. So what do we find elsewhere in the Bible that describes what we're reading about here when it says there were many that will follow at his heels? Well, we read in Revelation chapter 13, verse 3, that in the time of the end, all the world wondered after the beast. Revelation 13 is one of those seven pictures I mentioned, and the, uh, the motif is a beast that comes from the sea that looks like a leopard and has some other features. And, and the scripture tells us that at the time of the end that the whole world will wander after the beast. We're told in Revelation chapter 17 that, that uh, the kings of the earth and other branches of Christianity will have one mind and they will work together in collaboration to bring about what Satan has always desired to elevate himself in the position of worship. That was his intent going all the way back to the rebellion in heaven, and he is going to make one final attempt to uh, bring that about. And so Scripture says that there will be many that will follow at his heels. They will abandon the teachings of Scripture, and they will join together for the purpose of unity. Unity is great, but never at the compromise of truth. Can you say amen to that? Yeah. We must follow what the Bible says, even if we stand alone. We have to follow what the Bible says. That is the source of truth. So many will follow at his heels. Now verse 44, and in our, our few minutes that we have today, this is the phrase I want, want to point you to. News from the east and the north will trouble him. News from the east and the north will trouble him. What is that talking about? Well, I'm going to suggest to you, if you have your outline, I'm going to suggest that at this point uh, you turn to... Uh, the bottom uh, is number four under at that time, page one, number four. And it says there is news from the east and the north that troubles him and it cites him to go out with great fury. That's the last part of that verse. What is it talking about? It's talking about the clash of the kingdoms, the conflict between the forces of Satan and Christ. The troubling news is the three angels' messages found in Revelation chapter 14. And what do they contain? They have the everlasting gospel. What does the word gospel mean? It means what kind of news? Good news. How in the world can it be that good news would bring about trouble? Doesn't that seem like a paradox? Doesn't that seem like uh, words that don't belong together? And yet we find in the Bible that because of this uh, animosity that Satan has toward God, that there is a clash a conflict of the kingdoms. God brings good news. The good news is of his love, his plan of salvation, his plan to bring, bring about the end of the reign of sin. But this causes trouble for Satan and his followers. So the message is a message and an appeal for, of repentance. It's a message to, of a call for us to give ourselves totally to God to obey him in all things, but we recognize that when we do that, it's going to cause conflict. It's going to cause people to make a decision. So number five, I want to give you very quickly here the sequence of events that these verses lay out. And we'll have to go back and uh, uh, unwrap them a little bit in more detail later. But here's the critical timing that is involved in the close of the great controversy that we find in the last part of Daniel 11 and the first part of chapter 12. What does it involve? It involves the replication of Christ's character in his people. It's always been God's design for us to be made in the image of God. 
the replication of Christ's character in his people, and the faithful sharing of his truth. And that's what our church has called, been called into existence to do, to live out the gospel and to proclaim it. Now, of those two things, uh, which might we, we think which might we think is the more uh, important or more, the more predominant one, to live the gospel or to speak the gospel? Which is the most important, do you think? It's to live it, yes. We're told that when communication takes place, only a small percentage, maybe less than 10%, involves the verbal aspect. It's the nonverbal part that communicates the strongest way. Uh, we've heard the phrase, you know, practice what you preach and so on. This is what made Christ's sermons so powerful. There was nothing in his life that contradicted what he said. Now that's, that's a simple statement to make, but it's very profound. There was nothing in Christ's life that went against what he taught. And the, peop the people saw that he lived out the teachings of the gospel. And God is looking for people today, for you and me, to practice what we preach to live out the principles of his love and his gospel, and to proclaim, of course, the truths that he's given to us to share with the world. So this is what God wants to see happen. God wants to see people that will live out their faith and proclaim his truth. But that's going to result in the outpouring of wrath and fury by Satan's followers. It will bring about the enactment of laws against conscience. That's what it's talking about when it says that he will plant the tents of his palace or citadel or fortress between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. We'll go back to that and study it in a little more detail, but that's what it's talking about. When those laws come into effect, probation will come to an end. God has been giving mankind an opportunity to make a choice for him ever since sin began. There was an opportunity to make a choice, but God has to bring this to an end. It cannot exist forever. God ha It's too painful. There's too much sorrow and suffering. God has to bring this to an end, so there must be some mechanism by which people will make a choice, make a decision once and for all to follow God and keep His commandments or not. And when that time, that opportunity closes, then we use the phrase, the close of probation. It's, that phrase is not actually in the Bible, but the concept certainly is. Probation will close, and that was, is what brings us to chapter 12, verse 1, when Michael stands up. Again, we'll uh, study this in more detail, but what has been going on previous to this is the, is the great judgment in heaven, the investigative judgment. And I know some of you have had a chance to uh, attend court or maybe be involved as a juror in court. And you know that when the judge comes in and sits, that's when the trial begins. And when the judge stands up, that's when the trial is over. That's a simple concept to understand. When Michael stands up, the trial is over. The investigation has, the, the investigative judgment has come to an end. And these are all important critical cogs in the scheme that takes place at the end of time. When probation closes, then there will be the time of trouble that it mentions in chapter 12, verse 1. And again, we find there are corresponding verses in the Bible that, is, that describe this. Uh, in Revelation chapter 7, it talks about angels who are holding back the winds, winds representing the last great time of trouble. And if you remember that verse, what is it that they are waiting for before they unleash the winds? Until we have what? Anybody remember what it says there? Sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. That again represents the living out of faith that God wants to um, bring about in our lives so that we can give testimony to his truth in a powerful way. And when all this comes together, the seven last plagues will fall. And then verse, verse 1 will come to its glorious fulfillment. At that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. So I'm today giving you a very brief synopsis of what we're to, uh, going forward. I invite you to keep this outline and go over it and study it. And when we come together to uh, go over this passage again, which is going to be in two weeks, uh, we'll be able to give 
a little bit more uh, time to go over in detail what these things mean. mean uh, read Daniel 11, especially verses 43 through chapter 12, and uh, I'll let the Holy Spirit guide you as you study these very important key thoughts. I believe we're not far from the fulfillment of these very things. As we've mentioned, we've seen even this year how things can change rapidly and our lives can be altered in a significant way. And when God's people live out their faith, it's going to bring about the fury of the dragon and laws will be put into place to try to bring the world together into one unified body. But the laws that Satan is going to lead people to enact will be those that God's people cannot in all good conscience follow. Probation will come to its end. Yes, there will be travail, but that will be followed by deliverance. And I think every one of us today is looking forward to that great deliverance. You really want to live on this earth another 25 or 50 years or 100 years? What in the world would life look like if that were the case? We need Jesus to come. And we need him to live out his life within us so that we can show the world as well as tell the world what his love is all about. May God bless us to that end.